Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Mommy's gonna buy you a mockingbird. And if that mockingbird won't sing, Mommy's gonna buy you a diamond ring. Hello, my lovelies. This is Miss Murder. Well, things seem to have quieted down. Whatever that was hasn't come back. The slime has worked its way down. God knows where it went once it hit the heater grate. And things are cleaned up. And we are going to do a story. This is pretty short. Have you ever watched Monk? And I mean, everybody's seen Dexter. Have you ever watched Monk? This story reminds me of, well, actually not reminds. This story would be like if Monk and Dexter had a kid. It would be this fellow. It's called Awakening by Jeff Strand. When I discovered that I was the downtown Dixonville dismemberer, I took that shit seriously. It was something I'd suspected for a couple of weeks. The blackout periods, the blood stains on my jeans, the dismembered body in my garage. It wasn't until I found a live body in my shed, not yet fully dismembered, that I had to confront the truth. Who did this to you? I asked the man with no legs. You did, you psycho son of a bitch, he wailed. I looked at the hacksaw in my hand. I tried to convince myself that the scraps of flesh dangling from the blade did not belong to this man's leg. They could have been from somebody else's leg. Maybe they weren't even from a leg. It's not like I was a forensic specialist. I'm not saying that it wasn't pretty damning evidence that I was holding a bloody hacksaw over a guy with recently sawn off legs. It was. You'd have to be a fool to think otherwise. But in the moment, I did try to brainstorm other possibilities. Maybe I'd save the legless guy. I could have stumbled upon a psycho killer kicked his ass, dragged him to another room, taking his hacksaw with me to ensure that he wouldn't have it handy if he regained consciousness, and was now standing over the victim to assure him that everything was going to be fine. Am I a hero? I asked. No! <laughs> the legless guy screamed, you're a monster! I'm not calling you a liar, I said, but clearly you've had a traumatic experience and maybe you're not remembering things accurately. Hell, it's entirely possible that you've been hallucinating. I think I'd be hallucinating if I had that much gushing blood. Are you sure I'm the one who did this? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. All right. I guess you'd have no reason to lie. So yes, I was the downtown Dixonville dismemberer. What an awkward name. Hard to say out loud. When I was a child dreaming of one day becoming a serial killer, I always thought that I'd end up with a really cool nickname like Slashy Jim or something. What are you going to do to me? The man asked. That was a good question. Lots of possibilities. I could, for example, just leave. The man would presumably bleed out, and I could go on pretending that there was some alternate explanation for what had happened. If I let him die, he wouldn't talk to the police unless the police propped him up and jiggled his head around and spoke for him in a high-pitched, funny voice, which wasn't likely. Or, or, bear with me, I could saw off his arms. That would put me on low moral ground, obviously, but I never liked letting a job go unfinished. Like if a neighbor was mowing his lawn and he stopped halfway through because it started to rain, I'd look through the window and think, Dude, finish your damn lawn! 
I wouldn't actually mow the second half of his lawn for him because mowing lawn sucks, especially in this heat. What do you want me to do? I asked the man. Let me go! But that's kind of impractical, don't you think? Where are you going to go? Just stop hurting me! Well, I've already stopped. What you're asking is for me not to resume hurting you. I understand that you're under a lot of trauma, but communication skills are important. Please give me a phone. If I give you a phone and let you call for help, they'll be able to trace it to me. That wouldn't be very smart of me now, would it? It's kind of disrespectful that you would suggest that I would do something so stupid. Come on, man. I'm standing over you with a hacksaw. Why would you insult me? I'm sorry. I don't think you mean it. The man began to weep. I'm really sorry. Now I felt bad because it seemed like this conversation was turning into something where I was taunting a victim or something like that. But I swear I wasn't. Everything I was saying was sincere. I didn't have a wicked grin or anything. Nothing would have made me happier than if we could work this out in a civilized manner. You're bleeding pretty bad, I told him, even though I was sure he already knew. He didn't answer. Do you know how to make a tourniquet? He still didn't answer. Are you dead? No. You were acting kind of dead. Please respond to my questions to avoid further confusion. You do not want to get buried alive. Goodness, no. It's never happened to me, but you don't need first-hand experience to know that it's not pleasant. Now, what were we talking about before I thought you were dead? Tourniquet. That's right. Do you want one? The man shrugged. I'm going to have to look up how to make one online. Do you think you'll live long enough? That pool of blood underneath you is plenty big. I resisted the desire to splash my shoes around it. That would be undignified. The man closed his eyes. A rude piece of crap. Well, we'd see if having me soft one of his arms was motivation for him to pay attention to the conversation. It wasn't. I checked to see if he was breathing. No breath. I checked his heartbeat. No heartbeat. I checked his pulse. No pulse. This lack of breath, heartbeat, and pulse combined with the fact that several pints of his blood were no longer in his body was a pretty clear indicator that he'd passed away. To cut off the other arm of a man who was already dead was an extremely deranged thing to do. You couldn't exactly stand in front of a jury and have them nod their heads and say, Yeah, that's probably what I would have done under similar circumstances. I really, really wanted to cut off that arm. I'd missed out on the legs because of the blackout period, so I was feeling kind of cheated. Getting to saw off his last remaining arm would go a long way to resolving that feeling. Only a sick person would do that. But in contemporary slang, sick meant cool, and I wanted to be cool. So I'd do it. I'd saw off his arm. I saw it off his arm. It was kind of disappointing. Like when you have two slices of chocolate cake and you eat the first one and it's so delicious and then you think about how great the second piece is going to be but then you're full after the first couple of bites and you wish you'd saved it for later. Then I cut off his head. Also disappointing. Not as disappointing as the second arm but not nearly as fulfilling as I had hoped. I thought about cutting his head into several pieces, but no, that would be going too far. I settled for just cutting off his ears. He had very soft earlobes.
I realized that someone was watching me. I turned around and glanced at the police officer. His arms were crossed over his chest and he looked quite stern. I um uh, didn't know anybody was there, I said. Obviously. Am I under arrest? I think you know the answer to that. How long have you been watching? Long enough. But how long? That is none of your business. You would have had to open a door to come in here, and while I was cutting off his ears, I wasn't absorbed enough in my work not to hear a door open. It would have had to happen while I was sawing off his head. And I started to lose interest while I was doing it, so it would have had to happen when I just started sawing off his head. You just stood there and watched me saw it off? So? So why didn't you stop me? That also is none of your business. I think you were getting some kind of deviant pleasure out of it. No officer of the law would stand there and just watch a decapitation if he wasn't enthralled by the sight. You disgust me, sir. Oh, that's how it is. A man who saws off the head of an innocent victim can judge the spectator. Maybe I feared for my life. You've got a gun. I've only got a hacksaw. You could also have a gun. I haven't searched you. All the more reason to defuse the situation instead of watching it. If I'd seen you out of the corner of my eye, I could have taken out the gun, which I don't have, and shot you. The police nodded. Busted. I was watching because it made me tingle. So, now what do we do? <laughs> I don't know. Suicide pact? I shrugged. Yeah, all right. I let him go first. He blew his brains out, but instead of taking the gun and doing the same, I kicked it aside. Yes, it was a dick move, but by then I accepted that I was the kind of person who would back out of suicide packs. I cut up the police officer's body. It felt great. I was invulnerable. I was God. It turned out... I was not invulnerable and or God. My next victim had a taser and two brothers who were unhappy with me for trying to kidnap her. I'm in their garage. Ironic. Anyway, I suppose these are the last words of the downtown Dixonville dismemberer, which they were kind enough to let me write down in my own blood. Please excuse the typos. I probably won't talk to you soon, so enjoy the rest of your evening. Ah, that's just how Miss Murder likes them, short, sweet, and disgusting. Well, my lovelies, that's story number two, I guess. Story number one is still kind of a mystery to me, but uh, I don't have time to listen to it right now, so I hope it's a good one. And there is more to come. Thank you very much, and remember... Just because they look civilized doesn't mean they're not going to decapitate you. Good night.